Uh, I know some place, some people are connecting very early in the morning, others late in the evening. So I really appreciate uh, all of your efforts to, to join this conversation today. We are very excited about this event, which is a partnership between uh, UNIDIR and UNODA, and it will allow us to take stock of the progress made on bringing gender considerations into nuclear policy discussions. And it will also allow us to debate new ideas on how to take this agenda forward. Uh, as you recall, this was a conversation that was already fairly advanced in the current NPT review cycle. The importance of gender equality and gender perspectives in the review process has been stated in working papers, in statements, and chaired reports delivered in the previous preparatory committees. We feel it's important to get back to this topic ahead of the NPT review conference. As a brief recap, I would just like to note that the 2019 NPT PrepCon saw an increase in the number of working papers addressing the linkages between gender and nuclear issues. There were three papers uh, which covered this as the main, their main topic, three working papers. Additionally, during the 2019 PrepCom, over 20 statements delivered on behalf of more than 60 state parties addressed the relevance of gender perspectives to the NPT. And that was also reflected in the recommendations made by the chair of the PrepCom. So how can we take this to the next level? How can we translate these discussions into concrete actions? I think these are the main questions that uh, will guide our discussion today. And we are looking forward to listening to the ideas of the amazing speakers that are joining the panel today. But before we begin, allow me to share with you an overview of today's program, as well as some guidelines for this online event. We'll start with opening remarks from Izumi Nakamitsu, UN Undersecretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs. We are very honored to have her join us today. Ms. Nakamitsu assumed her position in 2017 and since then has been a champion for gender equality and for diversity more broadly in all areas of arms control and disarmament. Her remarks will be followed by a moderated discussion with distinguished experts and diplomats. We will have Ambassador Amanda Gorley, who is Ambassador for Arms Control and Counterproliferation of Australia. We will have uh, Michelle Dover, who is Director of Programs at Flowshares Fund. We will also hear from Amin Nasid, First Secretary at the Permanent Mission of Malaysia to the United Nations in New York. And we will hear from Dr. May Abdel Wahab, Director of the Division of Human Health at the IAEA. So you can see this is a truly stellar panel. After the panel discussion, we'll have a dedicated time for Q&A. And Ambassador Gustavo Slavinin of Argentina and President-designate of the 10th NPT Review Conference will deliver concluding remarks. Just a few notes about the Q&A. You can send your questions using the chat. Please don't feel you have to wait until the Q&A session to submit your questions. You can do it throughout the meeting. Uh, if you'd like to take the floor during the Q&A, Please indicate that uh, using the raise hand function or by writing in the chat. I'll make sure to pay attention uh, at all this at all times and also to try to make sure we can cover uh, most questions. We know sometimes this is not possible, but I'll do my best. Um, I would like to note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available at the NPT webpage. I guess that is it from me, and without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Izumi Nakamitsu to share her thoughts on this topic. Izumi, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renata. Uh, Ambassador Zwolfnin, distinguished panelists, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I could not be happier to open this event. The uh, increasing focus on gender perspectives in the MPT context is actually one of the more positive developments in nuclear disarmament. At a time when international security trends, including those related to this treaty, are divisive and destabilizing, 
it is good to be able to engage on an issue in disarmament where there is a groundswell for inclusivity and incorporating the views of often marginalized voices to achieve lasting results. I hope that today's event highlights recent efforts, and actually Renata um, alluded to them, including the excellent working papers from states parties, and serve as a platform to work towards gender being not only a focus at the MPT review conference, but establishing a truly gender responsive approach to the implementation of the treaty. Now, good progress has been made, but there is clearly much work to be done. No weapons or conflict is gender blind. Our disarmament and non-proliferation processes cannot be either. Without applying a gender lens and ensuring that diverse perspectives are addressed, our efforts risk to fail. Nuclear and indeed all weapons feed into the norms and power relationships that enable and foster gender inequality. As has been recognized in their summaries by successive preparatory committee chairs, women are biologically more vulnerable to the effects of ionizing radiation and than men, based on, on the experiences of the Hibakusha and test survivors, women are also often the ones most affected by psychological health issues, displacement, social stigma and discrimination. A gender responsive MPT is part of a global shift towards a more inclusive and people centered approach to security. It helps us to address the fundamental question of whose security is protected by weapons that, if used, would result in a human catastrophe with disproportionate impact on women and girls. The importance of gender dynamics, gendered dynamics, is increasingly recognized across the disarmament field. Secretary General Guterres's agenda for disarmament encourages member states to incorporate gender perspectives in disarmament as a contribution to the Sustainable Development Goals. To design disarmament policies and programs that are fit for purpose, we need systematic investment in gender analysis and disaggregated data. Such data illuminates the different um, experiences, realities, and needs of women and men in relation to all weapons. If we furthermore take an intersectional approach to gender, looking at how age, race, disability, and other aspects factor in, we stand to further deepen our insight, insight and effectiveness. I urge states parties to take a leading role in this pursuit. I also wholeheartedly concur with the president designate has, has consistently set an increasing an inclusive inclusive uh, review conference will increase the odds of success. We need to ensure that a diverse and gender balanced range of voices and perspectives are represented. It is only through the full and effective participation of women that we can attain sustainable peace and security, as affirmed by UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Regrettably, at the 2019 PRATCOM, only one in four heads of delegations were women. This is clearly not acceptable. States parties should pledge gender balance targets for their delegations to the review conference. More broadly, the MPT should be a part of efforts to transform the forces and systems that drive the systematic exclusion of women and other voices by creating inclusive cultures, enabling working environments, and efforts for removing biases and other obstacles to women's full and effective participation. As High Representative for Disarmament, 
and also in my capacity as, a, as an international gender champion, I remain committed to promoting gender responsive and inclusive disarmament. My office is working to support and raise awareness on strategies for gender equality throughout disarmament. Now, I look forward to working side by side with state parties, civil society and other stakeholders as we strive to make the MPT more inclusive and responsive and thereby more effective. I thank you very much for your attention and I am very much looking forward to the discussions today. Thank you. Back to you, Renata. Thank you very much, Izumi, for your uh, ideas, your thoughts, and much more for your action and the work that your office has been doing so far. Uh, we're very happy, uh, and I agree with you, that the inclusion of gender perspectives is one of the most positive aspects uh, in recent uh, times in, in nuclear policy. Uh, so now we can get started with our panel discussion. Um, the first person I would like to, to uh, hear from is Ambassador Amanda Gorley. Uh, we know Australia has been very active in this topic in the review cycle and beyond. And I would be interested in, in hearing from you, Ambassador, um, how can gender perspectives be sustainably included in the review process, if you have any thoughts on this? And uh, also, what are Australia's expectations for the review conference, for gender mainstreaming in the NPT cycle and beyond? Ambassador, you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Renata, um, and good evening from Canberra. Um, can everybody hear me? Uh, well enough? Yes, good. Um, well, and thank you to Izumi for her opening remarks. I think they really set the scene well for a good panel discussion. And, and as you have noted, um, this is a really important issue for Australia. We have been a very strong advocate of um, gender equality um, and we seek to lead by example. Um, we think gender equality leads to better outcomes and um, we also think it is the right thing to do. Um, our Minister for Foreign Affairs, can you still hear me? Because I, I was getting feedback, that's all. Um, so I took my earplugs out, sorry. Our Minister for Foreign Affairs, of course, is a woman, um, Senator Maurice Payne, and she's our second female foreign minister. And uh, she's also the um, former defence minister, and she was the first female defence minister in Australia. But she's also concurrently with being the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Women. Um, so she has it, you know, as front and centre of her mindset whenever she's uh, looking at these issues, um, the importance um, of both gender equality in terms of how Australia represents itself, but also um, applying the gender lens to um, our policy making and the way we pursue that um, internationally. Um, so, you know, we have, um, as you say, um, put quite a bit of priority on this um, and in pursuing it um, through the NPT process as well. Um, you know, co-authoring co um, various papers with other countries and um, trying to raise the profile of this issue. Um, we um, really also would like to acknowledge the work that UNIDIR has done to build a um, um, more awareness and understanding of this issue in the MPT context as well. And also, of course, in holding this webinar. So, um, getting to your questions, um, I don't think we have any um, magic answers here. And Izumi has already mentioned a couple of the uh, relevant um, steps that could be taken, taken by um, states' parties and by um, the broader um, MPT apparatus, I guess. Uh, one of the, the obvious things and one that we're uh, committed to is to increasing the number of women on our delegations and um, really encouraging other countries to do the same. Um, the 
role of statistics, of course, is very important and we um, value the work that has been done uh, by Unity to uh, track the progress um, of um, gender equality in um, uh, prep common review conference delegations. Uh, it's really important to have those statistics in order to fully understand the situation and um, to be in a better position to address it. Um, but we also think that we need to build understanding um, not just around inclusion of women on delegations, but also um, beyond the numbers themselves, the qualitative benefits of of having um, women represented on delegations um, and influencing uh, policy making in our capitals, decision making, um, contributing to debates, and um, you know making an impact um, in all sorts of different ways um, in the context of um, these issues. Um, there are things that we as states parties can do to um, build skills of women in um, international security issues. Um, an example um, is the Women in International Security and Cyberspace Fellowship, which Australia has funded with Canada, UK, New Zealand and Netherlands, which supports female policymakers to have negotiation skills training and then to actually put it into practice in New York. And that program resulted in gender parity in interventions in a formal first committee meeting for the first time in the committee's 75 year history. So just having um, uh, that opportunity to speak at an international forum is, is quite a significant um, step, I think, for many women. And we probably can all remember the first time we did it and how nerve wracking it was and how you know sometimes it still is. Um, the other thing, of course, is uh, the role of men in helping to drive change and to take actions themselves, um, to be advocates for the inclusion of women, both, with, both within um, their governments, but within, within their advocacy as well. And also when they're participating in events like this, for instance. I mean, I had an experience just a couple of weeks ago here at a conference where there were um, it was on international security issues. There were five panels. Only two of them had women on. And of the 19 speakers, um, 16 of them were men across the whole thing. Now, that really stands out to every woman in the audience and it undermines the, um, the sort of message of the conference and the objectives that it's trying to achieve. So it's really, you know, not, the one thing that struck me is why aren't the men who are on these panels, all of whom, you know, are surely aware of these issues, not saying I want a woman, a woman to be, you know, involved in my panel and, you know, taking that sort of leadership to, to um, raise expectations there. Um, I think that's really important. Um, so, you know, there are many um, sort of practical ways that that, that can happen. Um, also, of course, we've mentioned before the role of the chair um, in encouraging states to apply a gender lens when they're drafting reports um, and also um, for delegations to think about how women can be included in side events, um, including as speakers. Um, and also, I'd like to acknowledge the role of civil society. Uh, many uh, 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 women's voices are present in civil society and they play a very important role in um, raising awareness around these issues as well. Um, and also in the public diplomacy materials that UN and states parties put forward, it's important to uh, ensure that they also include uh, a good gender balance and rep representations of women and men um, in that context. Um, I might just stop there and uh, let others contribute. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I Yes, when you talk about how party it is that still in 2021 we have these conferences on international security 
that seem to be um, making an effort almost <laughs> to exclude women, given that how many, you know, uh, great women professionals and experts there are already in the field. And I think this has also been part of the movement that we've been seeing with the gender champions, that the first step is actually to say no to a single sex panel. And uh, I think this is a nice segue also to bring Michelle to the conversation. Michelle has been very active with the gender uh, champions in nuclear policy. And she also works at Plowshares, which is a very uh, important organization in the nuclear area. So Michelle, I wanted to, to hear from you. Um, what do you consider? Uh, what is a gender analysis? How do you implement it in your work? What kind of insights can you bring to this conversation? from the perspective of civil society, from the perspective of, of someone who, who works uh, in the nuclear space uh, with, with your foundation, Michelle? Thank you so much, Renata. Can you guys all hear me? Great. Um, so I think, you know, the, the first step is actually really important. And I, I think we should, I just want to echo what others have said today, looking at the number of participants on this call, looking at how this issue has been raised up, there is a lot of agreement that it's important. And I really don't want to leave that um, unstated, how important that first step is of recognizing that there's a problem and taking and then deciding to take action to, um, to fix it. And just echoing Ambassador Gorley, Unidir has played such an essential role in this when Plowshares first decided that it was going to apply a gender lens to its work, we started looking around to see where was the data that would actually help us understand the problem. I was getting a lot of questions from leadership, board members, others in the space about, well, is it if it's such a problem, what is the data and what is the scope of it? Unidir's reports were one of the only places that we could find um, such either qualitative stories or quantitative numbers. So um, deep appreciation from civil society for that work. Um, and you know, I think in terms of how we apply a gender lens, it really does come from this place of who is affected by the issue um, and who is rep whose voices are as a first step represented in making the decisions around it. Um, but as a part of that, it's not getting beyond the representation to which issues are prioritized, how they are discussed, um, and on what basis you're making decisions. It has to follow from that. And so, you know, for us, how do we get there? I think the first piece of it is um, around intentionality. Culture is something that each of us create. It isn't just handed to us. We're each active players in it. And so we have to make that choice to make those small steps and those small steps add up to changes in culture. And that's why I think there is so much focus on this panel pledge, this idea that you shouldn't have single gender panels. Um, and I, I just want to call out change is uncomfortable. If it was <laughs> if it was comfortable, we, you know, we probably would be able to fix this problem a lot quicker. And so, um, you know, and it's it's uncomfortable to do by yourself. And this is where I want to call out um, International Gender Champions, which was the inspiration for Gender Champions in Nuclear Policy. Um, they have they really gave us the blessing and the start um, to actually bring together leaders and into a network where you could actually turn to somebody else in another organization and say, I know you're facing similar problems that we are, or I know that I'm not the only person out there who's trying to create this change or has run into this problem with our board or can't seem to get it right when it comes to events. And that advice and that network, I know in our work has been absolutely crucial to preventing burnout, to actually leading to change, um, and to sharing innovative ideas, you know, for example, one of our members, um, and we're, we're a network now of, I think, over 60, uh, for a little plug for those of you who are international gender champions and are interested in joining gender champions in nuclear policy, please reach out. Um, we accept pledges from other networks. Um, but anyways, we had, um, you know, the, the pandemic has really affected women. And so each of the organizations in the network have really been struggling with how do we address this? Um, you know, and one example is what will the future of work look like once people can go back into the office? 
one organization had a really great idea on how to actually take a moment, take a pause and re-envision what work looks like through an internal structure and internal conversation. Plowshares Fund, as we consider the same thing, said, that's a great idea. We, we will use that and, you know, apply it within our own organization. So we really, you really want to see network effects when it comes to concrete change. And this is where I think this group and others should, should absolutely reach out and rely on others who are also, um, also pushing for change. The second thing, um, leadership matters. Uh, for those of you who oversee offices, Please do not ever expect those who work for you to be more brave and more courageous than you are yourself. You can hope that will happen, um, but please do not expect that. And know that those who work for you are looking up to you to see how far they can go and they will calibrate their actions to be in line with yours. So the braver that you are, the more space that you create in your own orbit, the more change is possible. I'm not saying everyone, you are all, all powerful. You all know the limits of, of what your influence is, but please also do not underestimate that influence and that tone. And I know for me, it is always the smallest steps that matter the most. It is watching my supervisor decline to be on an all-male panel. It is you know, hearing them say publicly that this matters. And what we're seeing across our grantees, across gender champions in nuclear policy, is that when leaders actually take these steps, you see this byproduct where people within the organization will suddenly step up to say, you know, this is great, you care, here's an issue that's actually really been bothering me, or here's a challenge I have come across in this organization. It actually creates the space to have conversations, knowing that this is a value that the leadership holds. And people will test that. They'll test it with small things at first, but you will get to those bigger and bigger conversations if you can navigate it and create that space. Um, the third piece, so how do you start? You start small. That's where all change starts. You don't have to start with the biggest thing in the world. Um, we recommend SMARTY goals, goals that are strategic, measurable, ambitious, realistic, time-bound, inclusive, and equitable. Basically, is it something that makes sense for your organization? And is it something that you can look back a year later and say, this is how the world is different because we pursued this action? And for us, for Plowshares, the way we turn that into practice, one of our main functions is grant making. So a few years ago, we said, we should probably look at how much money we give to women-led projects and women-led organizations. The number was pretty dismal. It was about 30% across all of our, uh, in terms of grants and in terms of numbers. And it actually varied by portfolio, um, but overall that was kind of where it was at. And so we said, okay, we'll give ourselves three years to change it. And we did it in two, simply by taking that measurement and then being intentional about the projects we were seeking out led to change. Now, what did that mean? Because representation, as we've been talking about, isn't everything. It's an important first start. But it actually led us to this moment where, you know, Plowshares as a foundation has shifted to really try to center that human value, that impact of nuclear weapons um, very broadly and use that, whether it's, you know, in our Iran work, in the um, what a threat of war might be, de-escalation in North Korea, but actually pairing some of these other issues that can easily be pushed out of a disarmament context in the name of the technical, in order to understand what makes whole of change across society. Um, and it's led us to funding different projects and bringing in different voices, I think, than we otherwise would. Um, so I think just finally, the the only advice I would offer is um, the other piece that we have found is you need to invest in expertise. Um, and it, it does take commitment in the same way that you look for a technical expert for your teams who can tell you what you know a specific safeguards technology is going to do. You also need that expertise to tell you what the gendered impact will be, 
But the one caution I would give is please do not rely on that person to change you or change your organization. There also really needs to be an expectation of a cultural competency in the leadership that they are not afraid to have these conversations. They have the basics of the language and the concepts. They don't have to be experts themselves, but in the same way that all of you understand broadly the issues with your own areas of expertise, gender needs to be a component. And with that, um, I'll let the next panelist take over. Thank you very much, Michelle. You touched on many uh, important things and, you know, provided a bit of a highlights of what's been happening in the past few years that are making this uh, such an interesting conversation. And I really appreciate your work and with Plowshares and also with the Gender Champions and all these structures of commitments. I think it's important to organize our goals internally and also to make us accountable. And as you said, uh, you set a time and sometimes you, you can face challenges in achieving the goal in that time and that's fine. And sometimes you can do as you did and even achieve it uh, earlier than expected. So and the, tra the transparency aspect, I think it's, it's very important as well. Uh, now I would like to move to our uh, colleague Amir Nasi, who is joining us from New York. Um, I mean, as Michelle was saying, there is the issue of building expertise. Uh, do you have any, any, any thoughts to share with us about how can states build their capacity to bring gender perspectives into nuclear policy? And if you can think of any, let's say, tools or resources or types of, of um, specific research, knowledge, training, what do you think would be important uh, to equip states to bring this to the forefront of the NPT review process? Uh, thank you, Renata. Thank you, Unidir, for organizing this virtual panel discussion on today's important topic, echoing Michelle earlier. Let me start by acknowledging the extensive amount of studies produced by UNIDIR as well as other organizations and entities pertaining to the underrepresentation of women in international fora concerning peace and security. For instance, it is interesting to quote statistics from 2017. We showed that the first committee on disarmament and international security as the lowest proportion of women, or the third committee on social, humanitarian and cultural issues as the highest proportion of women. Notwithstanding, we are pleased to know various studies that the proportion of women participating in disarmament diplomacy has grown steadily over the last four decades. In the context of nuclear weapons and the gendered impacts, uh, there are studies which underline uh, the ionizing radiation does not affect men and women equally. Over the long term, uh, those who are exposed to nuclear explosion, women and girls have a far higher risk of developing illnesses and cancer compared to men or boys. To respond to your first question, uh, Renata, in terms of states' capacity to apply a gender lens to a nuclear policy, we can safely say that it does vary according to a number of factors such as countries, geographical location, national policies and available expertise. Uh, for Malaysia, just like many other countries, it is a work in progress. We certainly recognize the importance of women participation in the MPT review process while we keep our focus on the overarching goals across the three pillars of nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation and peaceful uses of nuclear energy. For instance, during the third NPT PrepCom in 2019, Malaysia's national delegation was led by its Deputy Secretary General for Multilateral Affairs, who is a women senior diplomat and third in ranking among civil servants in the ministry. Our ministry continues to train women diplomats on the issue uh, so that they will be directly involved, whether in capital or in our respective missions in New York, Geneva or Vienna. 
to further promote this cause, we believe that continued and constructive engagement by the delegations which have been championing this cause will help to further deepen the understanding and heighten the level of awareness among the wider membership. Uh, as we engage, we should also avoid any negative sentiment which might suggest that the gender perspective detracts our attention from the pertinent goals of the NPT review process. Uh, needless to say, all these positions and policies must go through our respective capitals. However, at the individual level, all of us, we could already contribute to further progress by setting the right tone, reading, raising the subject of gender and simply encouraging increased participation of women. Uh, on this note, uh, we have seen uh, increasing positive trends and practice to ensure gender balance in panel discussions and events related to international peace and security, as well as the NPT, which is of course uh, demonstrated in today's panel discussion. I believe in this context, the gender perspective also enjoys a greater level of acceptance by the international community today, given the successful examples that we have around us, such as uh, high level officials, high representative for disarmament affairs, and a member of the current NPT Bureau. To respond to your second question, Renata, the 2019 NPT PrepCom, as you mentioned, saw an increase in the number of working papers addressing the linkages between nuclear affairs and gender. As for the way forward, including in the context of the NPT, we need to continue and advance the conversation on gender perspective. We should continue to encourage full and effective participation of both men and women in the NPT review process. To achieve the goal of gender equality in the platform of the NPT, we need to ensure that states parties have the necessary expertise and capacities to do so. This then leads us to the next question, the next point, which is capacity building to states parties, not just on the substantive issues under the NPT, but also having the additional dimension of gender because only after states parties have the necessary capacities will they be able to look into and implement gender equality in determining the official delegation for the NPT review process. Capacity building efforts need to take into account relevant factors such as the geographical location of countries, for instance, gender perspective in the context of international peace and security might not be uniformly interpreted or understood across different continents. This, of course, requires further consideration and analysis. On this note, we believe that we should explore various forms of collaboration beyond the conventional cooperation between states we need to seriously look into collaboration involving international organizations, civil societies, academia, research institutions to pursue the course of gender dimension for the NPT review process. And as we solidify the gender perspective in the context of the NPT, it will also fit into our respective national policies on gender parity. For example, for Malaysia, we have achieved 30% of women in decision-making positions within the civil service. And in the long run, our efforts to promote gender perspective into the NPT review process will also contribute to the achievement of goal five of the Sustainable Development Goals on Gender Equality. Thank you and I look forward to the interactive segment. Thank you very much, Ami, for sharing these ideas. Um, I think you're right. I think there is space for more capacity building activities and uh, we should definitely explore something like this. Also, I take your suggestion about the regional level. Um, we've been 
we 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 should look to do something with ASEAN ASEAN countries and with Malaysia, and uh, perhaps something modeling after what Ambassador Gorley was saying, the Women in Cyber Fellowship. So let me think about this, and I'll get back to you. <laughs> uh, now I would like to uh, bring May for to this conversation, Dr. May Abdel Wahab. She works at the IAEA. And you know, everybody refers to the NPT three pillars, and May works with the third pillar, the peaceful uh, uses of nuclear energy. And it would be great, May, to hear from you how does uh, gender feature in your work, um, if you have any concrete examples of um, gendered considerations, gender analysis informing uh, your work at the IEA. It would be great to, to learn from you, May. So thank you very much, Renata, and thank you for the organizers. We really appreciate the invitation today. So uh, if we want to think about the peaceful uses, there we can cover a large uh, variety, whether it's uh, through food security, agricultural um, act productivity, environment, water, so many. But today I'll limit it because of our limited time, of course, to human health. And I think when we're thinking about a gender analysis, looking at the differences in powers and barriers, opportunities, and the impact on people's lives are things to keep to take into consideration. But we have some really good examples that we can we can share. Um, and one of the things that we can apply something like a gender analysis to is things like um, the use of radiation in medicine. Um, examples include in cancer management, for example. So that would be for gender specific cancers. Another one would be for uh, diagnosis of let's say cardiovascular disease, which happens in everyone, but the outcomes are very different in women. And that's something that we want to look at. And, so, and also um, we can look at uh, specific gender specific side effects, for example, that, that, are, uh, that are looked at. Um, having said that, I just want to um, bring uh, uh, the panel's attention to the fact that some of the population-based studies uh, could have caveats, and we've heard some of that mentioned, and we have to be very careful about that. So a lot of the effects in radiation should be looked at through uh, controlled studies, um, you know, controlled clinical data. Uh, population-based studies are helpful but have their limitations because of some biases. So we have to be very careful about that, especially since there's individual radio sensitivity that could supersede gender-based uh, differences. So having said that, we can start with breast and cervical cancer, for example, um, as gender-specific uh, tumors, although breast is very rarely seen in men as well. <clears throat> and we know that um, radiotherapy, for example, is an important treatment. So when we look at this particular issue, we're looking at, for example, cervical cancer, a preventable, a treatable cancer that still kills 300,000 women a year, and many more go through morbidity and other, other issues. So that is a very clear example of a, a, an important area where we need to do this, these kinds of analyses to see why is this happening. So that's, again, peaceful uses of radiation. Um, and not only that, but there's another perspective, for example, for breast cancer in terms of conserving the breast. So um, one option is, let's say, a mastectomy, another is conserving the breast with radiation. And yet the penetration of that treatment is not, is not homogenous, depends on the, on the country and the region, and it's not always related to income. So there are gender perspectives in that in that area that are really important and how to be able to address that. So we have an equal opportunity for women around the world to preserve, you know, various organs and, and so forth. In addition, we know that, for example, um, if we talk about prevention of cervical cancer, there's uh, HPV vaccination has a lot of gender issues and norms that are attached to it that affects the penetration of this important life-saving prevention that could prevent a lot of morbidity later on. So there's so many gender related issues that really would be helpful to look at and related to the treatment and diagnosis, as we said. The other one is cardiac disease. I mean, we know that women get less heart attacks, but when they get it, more women die of these heart attacks. It's more deadly, so why? They're diagnosed less, or they're diagnosed later, 
the symptoms are not typical, so people are not aware. There's so much work to be done. And again, it's very gender specific. There's no need for that. There, there are things that we can do to, to, to address that. And as you know, we, we, diagnostic imaging is, it helps diagnosis in, in cardiac disease um, and so forth. So there's a huge role for peaceful uses initiatives in that area to save lives and make the outcomes more equitable. Then we have, of course, gender specific side effects. So for example, for abdominal pelvic radiation, uh, there are specific uh, side effects in women that maybe until relatively recently were not as recognized um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, inducing menopause in some situations um, and addressing the symptoms that are related to that uh, in terms of, um, difficulties, um, you know, in, in, in many different, you know, specific areas that are related to, to women. And many of them were just simply ignored and women just suffered through it instead of looked at and treated and, and addressed. So uh, there's a lot of, a lot of really tangible uh, situations in terms of peaceful use initiatives that we can really address, whether preventing death, whether so many, and why such a simple, treatment that could really save lives is not is not always used even if it's available sometimes is is something that we really need to look at so uh, in addition to that we have we have things that um, you know are are um, peaceful uses in nuclear energy that we'd look at gender that could be supported uh, related to let's say training and and leadership so if we look at for example young women that go into the sciences in medical school you have in some countries you have 50 percent of women are in medical school and then you come and look at how many are in radiology or radi radiotherapy could go down to less than 30 percent or even less depending on the specialty and subspecialty and some like interventional radiology it's even less so what what's happening to the pipeline i mean we're there but what what how, how can we push people to the next step but then if you look at leadership, it's even less. So you go to, you know, professors or chairs or, you know, as you go up the ladder, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that in, in effect will affect everything downstream in terms of mentorship, in terms of the next, you know, women getting into the field, so many other, other areas. So we really need to work on, on, on all of these areas. And those are just some examples in terms of peaceful use initiatives that we can we can mention, um, you know, briefly. Um, but there's a lot to be done. And I don't think uh, I mean, I could share that with you, but I'll I'll, uh, I'll let you continue the questions. Thank you, mate. That's uh, very interesting because uh, when you bring gender, you're also bringing cultural aspects sometimes, right? What are the, yeah, what are the norms around this? these issues and why if something is available even though it's available and, and accessible why isn't being used so i think these are some of the benefits of applying a gender analysis to our field of work it allows us to address culture it allows us to address the human face of war and put humans at the center and by doing so, uh, I think we can also uh, make our work more effective. Uh, now I would like to, to open the floor um, for questions, comments, and, and interventions. We have, um, we are doing okay in time. We have half an hour for this uh, interactive part. And uh, so I would just like to, to ask if anyone um, would like to, to share something or pose a question to the panel. Uh, I'm paying attention here to the um, to the chat. Uh, I see one comment from IEA, and it's about um, the IEA's work on um, with the Marie Curie Fellowship. And I see May has a her hand raised. So. So thank you for that. I mean, um, if we talk about what can be done, I think we have a very good example um, or many examples at, at the IAA. And um, we can address this is the problem, but, but finding uh, good solutions is extremely important. So for the pipeline solution, there's a very unique um, 
opportunity that was started by our, but our, by our director general, which is uh, who is also a champion, of course, um, and for uh, gender parity. And um, one of it is the Marie uh, Curie Fellowship. And we had a hundred young women who are going to who have received this fellowship and are going to be doing their masters in nuclear sciences because of this fellowship specifically targeted to increase the number of women in this uh, pipeline. And so that's that's quite unique and, and, and as I said, specifically for nuclear sciences of all kinds across the board. So this was in November of 2020 when we, when we brought in our first class of 100 women. Um, I will say that, um, again, the whole initiative uh, within the IAA is quite significant in many areas. Um, it starts from the top, as our colleagues said on the panel. Uh, we have our, um, as I said, our DG is a member of the IGC Global Board and co-chairs the IGC Impact Group on Gender Equality in Nuclear Regulatory Agencies. Um, and we have now our action plan is, is quite significant in terms of not only the pipeline, like I said, but also in terms of reaching out. Uh, we have a partnership with WIN to identify experts in the field. We are trying to bring in experts within all our uh, panels like this one and, and other uh, activities, projects, everything like that. We're looking at that and trying to stimulate and encourage women to be, uh, to be part of and to have uh, parity, but I think representation across the board as well. Um, applying for vacancies is an issue. We all know about the, the ability of the informal, um, information sharing that happens, right? And a lot of times, if you're not part of that group, you're outside and you don't learn of the vacancies. So how do we deal with it to reach out to women across the world to be able to inform them, whether through webinars, whether through, uh, you know, fairs, virtual fairs, to be able to tell them this is what's happening, come and join us and so forth. Um, and then, of course, monitoring and accountability is extremely important. Reporting, knowing what's happening, all of these things are important. Um, and basically, um, you know, it's, as I said, it starts it starts from the top, and each one of us has that responsibility to keep moving forward. But but definitely, the IA has been working very hard at, at doing that, including in looking at projects and how we address the various projects. I gave a couple of examples, but there's so many more, so I won't. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you, May, for bringing up the Marie Curie and all the other actions that uh, IEA is taking. Uh, as with these things, it will take time for us to see the impact, and I, I really hope uh, there is like a, a long-term commitment and we can, can be able, as you were saying, to monitor and track progress on this. Uh, I see Michelle has her hand up. If anyone else uh, would like, also please use the raise hand function. Michelle. Yeah, no, and, and the IEA has really done an incredible job on this. And, you know, this is where fellowships, you know, and, and I, I think what the IEA has done is just the way it's using the resources that it has to make the changes that it wants to see is a really a model for others to think about. But I also don't want those who don't have the, uh, the resources of the IEA to think that it's only money or only people that will lead to this change. If you don't have the ability to create a fellowship, you can be looking at, you know, who do you cite in your reports and your memos and your documents? Who do you consult? as you create your policies? Um, what do you do to uplift the experts that are from your own country who are women? There are a variety of ways to think about change that don't always involve um, money or other types of resources that you may not have. Sometimes it really is about the time. Yes, couldn't agree more, Michelle. Uh, Amit, please. Thank, thank you, Renata. It's interesting to hear the discussion and comments and inputs by distinguished panelists. Um, I certainly concur with the view that IEA has contributed a lot to this area. And I just wish to pick on one specific comment made by distinguished representative of the IEA uh, on the concept of pipeline. 
Uh, and I also believe that we've been discussing a lot on the element of culture and norms. So as we go through the pipeline from junior level to middle level and higher level management, the percentage of women gets lowered, unfortunately. Uh, and I also believe that we've lost uh, a whole uh, group of bright uh, women uh, students and scholars early on in the pipeline at the very junior level and even before entering the junior level uh, in the context of our workforce like diplomacy and academia and research institutions meaning to say that as for certain region and certain continents the level of awareness is high i believe among universities and students to know the areas of possibility what kind of career that they could venture into but for certain region and continent for example southeast asia malaysia and in our immediate region my recollection is that the area of international peace and security is perhaps at the very bottom of the list even among boys like in my case i never thought that i would venture into this field because we will always consider the conventional career to become a doctor an engineer lawyer because those are the safe options none of us will ever dream of becoming diplomat talking about nuclear because it's just too unconventional and unfamiliar to us so i think it would be useful if we could look into the element of pipeline early on at the level of universities undergraduates and graduate level so that these bright students uh, girls would know the possibilities would be exposed to the possible areas and careers that they could venture into and they don't just be limited to what they watch on the tele television just like in my case turn on the television is just always an exclusive group of dignitaries and, and diplomats and i would never uh, dream of it because it's just too far from me and i'm a boy i was a boy and not a boy anymore but in the case of girls i'm sure they felt perhaps a high level of impossibility to reach and i th i think having the outreach uh, the promotion and the examples that i mentioned the successful examples today would give the uh, uh, the motivation and inspiration to them and they will feel that yes they can do it and they will uh, pursue and because of that i think that will increase by a huge amount the percentage at the early stage junior level so that by the time we reach the higher level management then we have a high percentage of women which we desperately need now thank you thank you amit uh, i see a couple of uh, hands raised. I think I'll go to the audience first and then May, I'll get back to you in a second if that's okay. Uh, I see here Vanessa Wood. Vanessa, would you like to take the floor? Hi, thanks. Sorry, I had a little trouble uh, undoing the mute button. Um, nice to see everybody and, and thank you very much. Um, for the, the presenters. Um, there's a couple of issues. There's how we implement, how states parties implement the NPT on a daily basis. And then there's how we actually um, uh, operate at the review conference. And I think that, you know, the, the chair has a really important role to play and states parties have an important role to play as well in setting up the right processes and the right expectations and the, the right questions to ask. Um, about applying a gender analysis. But um, I'd be really interested in, in um, Michelle's perspectives because one of the things I think we need to be aware of is at the review conference, when the chips are down and we're dealing with really difficult issues, it's all those informal processes of who gets pulled into the informal meetings and how you actually manage to crunch through some really, really challenging issues in a way that is inclusive and takes account of diverse perspectives that is going to be incredibly challenging for, for the chair. And Michelle, I'd be really interested in your views on what 
What does civil society expect and what would you hope for from states' parties in how we conduct ourselves once it really gets down to the wire and, you know, people maybe haven't had a lot of sleep? Thanks very much. Thank you, Vanessa. Really good to see you. Uh, before we move to to Michelle and the others, uh, I would like to give the floor to Ambassador and Sophie Nielsen. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes, very good. I also want to thank both the, uh, the organizers and um, the panelists for, for a very interesting discussion today. And I'm very glad that there is uh, that, you know, for the strong, not the least uh, engagement by UNODA and UNIDIR, uh, but also as we hear from the IAEA on actually um, keeping this topic on the agenda ahead of the REVCON. I think we've uh, made uh, quite some progress over the last, uh, over this review cycle. So we just need to keep the momentum going and we all have a responsibility. Representing Sweden, of course, this is, <laughs> this is a, a top priority for us, but I also want to mention um, the Stockholm Initiative on Nuclear Disarmament and one of our 22 stepping stones uh, proposing uh, is also focusing on, on uh, a gender perspective and gender representation. And I know there are so many others that, that also brings this up. So I think that is a first hand, a good thing. The second uh, issue I wanted to bring up was a little bit along the lines as Vanessa just mentioned that I think it's important that we you know how we reflect upon how we as state parties and and of course um, uh, for the for the president designate and the main committees how do we actually you know how what do we want possibly in written language in order to, to, to have a positive progress, including uh, adding to and follow, being able to follow up in the coming review cycle. So that would also be very interesting to hear from, from the panelists on, you know, on how we can, you know, take this process um, into actual action, including um, follow up because uh, as, as uh, your Unidir's report and others, you know, uh, if we don't have facts and figures and can, can show progress or no progress, we will not be able to really come to the core. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I'll give the floor to um, our colleague from Chile, Pamela Moraga, and then I'll also read the questions in the chat because I saw a few of them came. And uh, and then I'll also I'll give the uh, I'll pass the word back to the panelists if that makes sense. Uh, Pamela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Renata. Can you hear me? Thank you very much for the organizers and to Unidir again for for organizing this event and the panelists. It has been incredibly uh, interesting. Uh, I would have a question to all panelists and also to pick up on a comment. Uh, the question would be, um, it's been said that resolving the gender disparity is not just a matter of equality, but a matter of national security. Paraphrasing one of Unidir's report, Connecting the Dots, how would you connect this uh, paragraph, this affirmation to the nuclear field? Which are the specifics of the nuclear field that we should take into consideration uh, when talking about national security? And the other comment is more politically sensitive. Uh, I would like to thank Amir uh, for his comment on uh, in his presentation. Amir, it was great to see you. Uh, Vanessa, likewise. Um, regarding the fact that uh, the gender, discussing about gender should not be considered as deflecting the implementation of the three pillars of the NPT. I think this is core to take into account for the next uh, for this, uh, for the review conference and for the next cycle, because it has been seen very in, in various foras. And this is sotto voce. This is something that you hear, but is not repeated in foras, that perhaps this talking about gender 
is just about uh, deflecting uh, uh, the discussion because we have made no advancement in the disarmament uh, field. Uh, I think that there is, uh, it's good that uh, Amit raises this. And I think that it's our responsibility as, as delegates as well to actually use this opportunity uh, to reverse and create a positive narrative in that regard, stating that the fact that if you are talking about gender and disarmament, it's because we there's a change required. And this might be one of the core angles that we should tackle. Uh, thank you very much, Renata. Thank you very much, Pamela, for bringing this, these topics to our attention. Uh, I understand what you're saying about the issue of uh, if, if gender is a distraction or not from, from the, the topic at hand. Uh, just to say, uh, I mean, countries can find many other distractions. I don't think gender is the only one that, the only topic that could fit, could be framed as such. But uh, hopefully, uh, I th we are we are past that, and and we can all agree that it's part of uh, the interest at hand and the security of all countries. Uh, looking at the chat. Uh, there was one, um, Mary Olson uh, wrote about the mention of disproportionate impacts of ionizing radiation. I think this was already brought up by uh, Izumi Nakamitsu and also by Amir. He was also referring to that, but uh, just to make sure that this is a clear finding from, from research and recognized in the CPNW. And we have two other questions as well. Uh, one is about... Uh, if panelists think gender aspects are going to be included, discussed in the upcoming NPT review conference, and if uh, if they think countries assuming a feminist foreign policy are going to bring these discussions as well. Um, I think there, from, from what I'm, I'm hearing, there is an interest in bringing this to the NPT. Uh, I think we already have some baseline based on chair summaries of encouraging, recognizing, acknowledging the full and equal participation. And I would like to add leadership of women in, in, in the process and also the issue of um, uh, ionizing, differentiated impacts of ionizing radiation has also featured in previous um, chair summaries. But uh, let's, let's hear from our panelists. Uh, I would like to go back to you. Um, Feel free to to respond to the questions that uh, you think were were addressed to you, or these more general ones about, let's say, what um, Ambassador Newsom was saying, what kind of language we would like to see, and what kind of action is needed to take this forward in the next uh, NPT review conference. If I may, uh, let's follow the order that we used for the presentation, uh, Ambassador Garley. Do you have any immediate reactions to what, what was said in the discussion? Thanks very much, Renata. And I've been uh, listening with great interest to uh, the other panelists and uh, the um, uh, other contributors as well. Um, and I would really like to um, acknowledge the work of Plowshares um, in this space and just say how, um, you know, as someone who's relatively new to disarmament issues, how refreshing it is for me to be able to listen to your podcasts and hear strong female voices speaking about these issues. I think it's really important for, um, for female voices to be out there and making a very, um, you know, credible and well-informed contribution. Um, I, I think we still too often see reports, studies, task force um, uh, products, think tank products where um, the those engaged in creating them, in one recent example, a wholly male. And um, again, you, it for me undermines the, the credibility and the value um, of that work if they haven't even had the foresight to think we might need to get some female um, perspectives um, on the work that we are doing. 
um, it shows a certain blindness. Um, I think in terms of outcomes for the uh, review conference, um, yes, definitely um, would expect to see um, gender equality and gender issues reflected um, in either the chair's statement or whatever final um, document um, or chair summary or whatever final document we might end up with. Um, I think, you know, certainly the work of the Stockholm Initiative in this in this area is very welcome. Australia um, is uh, a member of the Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Initiative and we um, have been developing a number of um, textual change um, proposals of our own in a landing zone document and we are very open to working uh, with others who have specific um, proposals um, in that respect. Um, I think uh, the argument that discussion of gender deflects from uh, you know, disarmament efforts and the work in the three pillars is actually a diversionary argument in and of itself. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's sort of a, a, an argument that serves those who are making it, um, you know, because it kind of ignores the potential impact of having of greater gender participation in these discussions um, and the potential positive impact that could have on um, achieving the aims of the MPT. So I, I personally don't take those um, arguments um, very seriously. And again, I think it, it comes down to leadership and to um, uh, all of us who have the opportunity to um, make a difference in this space to, to be active and courageous, as Michelle said, um, in doing it. And it, it is a a um, an evolving process. Um, it's not you're not going to um, achieve everything, um, you know, all at once. It's going to take time, but we just have to move forward and uh, stick to our guns. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador Michelle. Over to you. Well, yes, and thank you for those kind words. Um, you know, the podcast has been a really great way to hear from so many different people and hear their stories and their expertise. It's it's always a pleasure to lift them up. I think to the specific question asked to me about what does civil society expect from Steve's parties when the chips are down? Um, most of the work for a negotiation happens before it even starts, right? And we know that once you do get into that crunch time when everyone is running on no sleep, um, you are going to rely on the materials and the networks that you brought into the room. And so I think that's where in order to see progress, we are, you know, I really appreciate this webinar happening when it is. Um, the interest that people are taking to strengthen their networks, their positions, their papers now so that when the chips are down, it's easier to figure out what are the priorities? Where does gender fit in that? Is it, I mean, from a civil society perspective, it's, you know, or at least from a plowshares perspective, gender is part and it's an existential part of fixing this problem. Um, you know, and this goes to the, the other question about how does gender equality matter in a national security perspective? Um, from from our perspective, it's you can't make policy and expect it to be sustainable if you're excluding half of the population of the world. Um, and, you know, this is how you get iPhones that are too big for pockets, right, <laughs> for half of the population, because no one bothered to consult half of their consumership. And so I think, you know, this is this is where the two things are linked. We do see, expect to see progress. We do expect it to be hard. Um, we're not saying it's going to be easy to change how things are done or how you prioritize various things, but we do see it as a key part of reaching sustainable solutions. Um, and simply, you know, the research from McKinsey and Harvard Business Review, I mean, you see that as you expand out the perspectives on a team, Immediate, what the immediate result is that more options become possible. 
more options are credible. Now, the other piece that nobody likes to talk about is then how do you navigate the conflicting perspectives? And that is just that inclusion is just as much a part of this process as is the creation of diversity. But, you know, we're still in a lot of ways on that first step of expanding the table. Um, and we'll, we'll have to manage the other step as it goes along. But I think that's where we're, we're very clear eyed that yes, it's a challenge. It is harder to prioritize, but it's also going back to that question of what, do, how do you see its relation to the issues at hand? And then and what have you done to prepare for it? Knowing that this situation is coming, um, are the two areas where we would expect to see change and expect to see work. Thank you, Michelle. I noticed there is one hand raised here uh, in the chat. Tony Yakis. Tony, do you want to take the floor and 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 pose a question to the panelists? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Renata and Nunidir, for all the work that you uh, uh, do on this issue. And also um, uh, to the panelists uh, for, for reminding us of, of several initiatives. I, I wanted to take the floor to offer three comments. Uh, I, I don't want to sound a little bit um, I don't want to sound pessimistic. I agree with everything that has been said. Uh, I want to say beforehand, uh, there is no question about uh, the importance and the, the, the relevance of, of, of this issue as a solution to the problem. But uh, first, I want to, 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 to raise a, a little flag of caution uh, uh, because we have to distinguish between two issues. One, mainstreaming language regarding gender um, equality into the MPT negotiations. And the other issue is enhancing the participation of women. And I want to say meaningful participation of women, because uh, what we see, uh, unfortunately, is that delegations sometimes have a lot of women, but they are not part of the decision making process inside their delegation, even not even at, this, at, the, at the negotiating table. And this has to do with the resources that each uh, delegation has, with the amount of expertise they have, uh, things that we have talked about before and that my colleagues, especially uh, Amir, has already uh, signaled in this seminar. But meaningful participation is something that we have to promote, that we have to uh, um, raise awareness um, about, and um, there are maybe ways in which this can be this can be also uh, 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 used for the advantage of negotiations. For example, I have been in negotiations in which chairs uh, 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 choose deliberately women inside the delegations to, or, or, or uh, women with special, special um, expertise or seniority to participate in the in the in the consultations and uh, even if they are not heads of the delegation for example so in this way you can you can balance the amount of heads of delegation that are men with the amount of expertise that are in the delegations that might be more women so this is one one issue the other is the mainstreaming of the language and i think that what uh, uh, amir and pamela have said uh, are something uh, are, are some issues that we have to take uh, uh, very seriously because what we are seeing in, in multilateral affairs is that mainstreaming the language of gender in other uh, documents in in areas in which this issue is recognized and it's approved but including the language has even risked the adoption of texts so I, I wouldn't even call that a distraction. I would say uh, something that we need to be very clever and very serious about so that this doesn't constitute an obstacle for having a text. I, uh, so I, I, I wanted to, so to say this. And the, the last thing I wanted to say uh, uh, in reaction to the very, very thought provoking comments regarding uh, some initiatives about mentorship and about how to um, 
how to uh, 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 enhance and 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 and, and make a, a better use of the resources and 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 uh, increase the, the the capacity building of women is is to 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 realize that uh, fortunately uh, we are in a in a new area in which young people are more interested uh, and have more resources to be um, uh, educated and to have more uh, uh, capacity uh, uh, built uh, on these issues and more expertise. But um, uh, I think that uh, uh, one of the important issues is not to forget that uh, they don't, the, the young, young people uh, will not learn from historical a, a memory and from historical experience uh, if they are not uh, a, a paired and uh, near uh, older generations and all the generations of women that we didn't have this kind of resources to be trained in international and in international affairs. So I think that the, 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 the most uh, uh, fruitful uh, source for me from a point of view for, for capacity building is mentorship more than um, other other areas because in this in this way you can use the historical memory of of previous generations and and not only women men and women can mentor uh, young uh, participants or young women participants to help them about their career choices of course but also about uh, things that are not taught in universities websites and seminars <laughs> thank you Thank you, Tony, for adding these very insightful comments uh, to the discussion. Great to see you. I'll continue going back to the panelists. Uh, Amir, if you can share your final thoughts and then May, so we can move to also the concluding remarks by the ambassador. Amir, please. Thank you, Renata. I noticed that our conversation gets more lively and exciting as we near the end of our session. Uh, I'm glad that we have a few uh, strong and courageous women diplomats with us, uh, such as uh, Tony of Mexico and Pamela of Chile. They've been very constructive and uh, resourceful in their contribution throughout our uh, work for, for many years. I wish to respond to the first question on gender disparity runs beyond gender equality, uh, especially when we talk about national security. I think we should look beyond mere statistics uh, along the lines mentioned by Michelle and Tony. It's not just about numbers, but also about the outcome and results. When we have women around the table uh, being part of the discussion, negotiation and drafting of the policies, the results will be better compared to not having them. Uh, this is our own experiences uh, in our line of work. Uh, second point, the quality of deliberations, uh, having women on board is just simply better than not having them. Uh, and we should look into this element of diversity, creativity, uh, different perspectives and psychology, and we need to really harness and tap into all the resources. Uh, third point is the fact that gender should not detract our overall deliberations in the context of the NPT. This is certainly an important point. Uh, it has been elaborated by others uh, well. Uh, my only comment is that we need to look into two aspects of it. First is the substance. Second is the tone. The substance, when we talk about gender in the context of the NPT, we already have working papers and previous uh, summaries uh, of the PREPCOMs to serve as a basis for future deliberation. So that can be a basis for our work and we should leverage on them. The second point is on the tone of our discussion. Of course, there are varying level of interests and priorities among states parties when talking about gender. Uh, understanding and respecting that varying level of priority accorded by state parties. We need to approach this topic uh, skillfully and carefully so that we in the end manage to increase the level of awareness and understanding 
while not allowing it to become a possible um, block, which should not be, and I don't think it will be. So I think at the end of the day, it requires our skillful and careful uh, deliberation and stewardship so that we know that we don't uh, press the wrong button and take the wrong step. Otherwise, it will just trigger unnecessary debates on issue that is universally acknowledged and recognized. Uh, thank you, Unidir, and thank you, Renata, for the opportunity. Thank you, Amir. May, any final thoughts to share with us before we move to Ambassador Lauvinen? So very, very quickly, I think diversity in general has shown better outcomes in, in every field. It's not specific to this field. And I think that if we consider diversity overall and inclusion, we can consider it in different areas, not only gender. But gender happens to be 50% of the population. So imagine 50% of the population is excluded. I think that's how we need to look at it. It's not a women's issue, a man's issue, whatever. It's, it's more of a diversity issue. And I think that we'll do better, all of us, if, we, if we're able to do that. I just wanted to make a quick comment about uh, population-based studies because that was brought up in the chat and nobody had really addressed it. And while uh, population-based studies have our, our hypothesis forming, but that's all they are. And it's really important to take that with a grain of salt of the, you know, it doesn't take into consideration individual radio sensitivity, which is significant, or comorbid factors, or many other things. So um, I would say controlled randomized studies in, let's say, radiotherapy or diagnostic imaging are a good way to be able to really make sure that we're, we're not over uh, interpreting some of these, these bases. So I just want to, it's a word of caution. And I think there, the individual differences are greater than, I think, just gender differences. And finally, I just want to thank you for this excellent uh, discussion. Uh, we're looking forward with such a wonderful group of champions of this issue that we see changes and to the betterment of all of us and to inclusion of our, our of course, our, our male, male colleagues. It's just a diverse group of people. Thank you so much. Thank you, May, and thank you to all panelists. Ambassador Slavinen, you see the task ahead of you to bring gender to the forefront of the NPT review cycle. And you know also uh, with the people and the institutions and the organizations which you can count on. Uh, I now have the honor to give you the floor to share your concluding remarks. Embajador, por favor. I'm not sure we can hear you. You should be unmuted now, Ambassador. Ambassador, would you like to? Okay, we'll wait a little bit. If I may, I can use this time also to promote, do some advertising. Uh, at the UNIDIR website, there is a gender and disarmament hub. Uh, if you click on gender perspectives, there is this NPT is one of the sessions and you can read more about how gender has featured in the NPT review cycle so far. Okay, the ambassador is going to join by phone. Sí. Can, can you hear me now? Sí, ahora. Yeah, so let me just... Yeah, give me one second. 
it was working until now, sorry, on the laptop, and now I have to move to the iPhone. Technologies, yes? I'm really sorry about that. No problem, uh, we can hear you loud and clear now, Ambassador. I have to be a bit creative now. Okay, anyway, um, thank you, sorry about this. Um, High Representative uh, Nakamitsu Isumi, uh, Dr. Delacqua, Renata, distinguished panelists, um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased extremely pleased to to be associated and part uh, of this event and i'm very grateful uh, to have listened to the many interesting and very important views and suggestions um, given by our distinguished panelists uh, throughout this uh, mpt review cycle gender has indeed emerged as a topic of growing importance and thanks to the leadership and commitment uh, of a group of state parties and civil society, a spotlight has been shown on an issue that affects all of us. It is also one in which I believe state parties can make genuine progress at the next review conference. Thankfully, due to the postponement of the review conference due to the pandemic, in addition to the excellent working papers submitted by state parties at an event at the preparatory committee meetings, we also have at our disposal the results of the various side events and other activities undertaken by states and civil society during the hiatus. I hope that we can draw on this in seeking to advance this cause. I also believe there is general agreement among the parties about the fundamental importance of promoting the equal, full and effective participation and leadership of both women and men in nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation and peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Unfortunately, and we have heard today, there is much, much to be done to actualize and implement that agreement. As we have heard today, like many bodies concerned with international peace and security, the MPT review process has seen an under-representation of women in not only numbers, but in delegation leadership and participation. Equal, full and effective participation is not about tokenism, it is about enabling the vital contributions women make to nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation and the peaceful uses of nuclear energy and ensuring that their voices are heard. As one of the working papers submitted to the 2019 Preparatory Committee highlighted, participation by more women does not necessarily make it meaningful. Women must be more involved in the decision-making processes that surround the MPT, including at the Rio conference. And there are many, many ways in which the parties can remedy this issue, including by, as the High Representative noted today, making gender delegation pledges. Now, the second issue is even more far-reaching. When we talk about the gendered impact of nuclear weapons, we must, of course, focus on the body of research that highlights the disproportionate health, social and economic impacts a nuclear weapon detonation would have on women. But in the context of the MPT, we must think more broadly. This means taking what has been called a gender lens, and today we have heard about that to all of the issues we deal with in the review process and thinking in a gender responsive way when it comes to all three of the MPT's pillars. And this starts with access and education, especially to and about the peaceful uses of nuclear science and technology. It also includes equality in the policy making in the traditionally male dominated security field in which the MPT resides. Anyone who has been listening to me over the last 12 months has heard my position. I'm not responsible for what goes 
into any final document or outcome from the review conference. That is entirely the prerogative of state parties. However, I do believe that state parties should consider how to include the issues that have been discussed today, including how to utilize the tools that can help realize gender responsive policy, some of which have been highlighted to our panelists. I thoroughly endorse the many calls I have heard today for an inclusive review conference. This is because I believe that a plurality of views helps produce lasting results as of today, Isumi recall us all. For the review conference, this means space for civil society to, to express their positions, an opportunity for industry to participate, a platform for the younger generations to have their say, and critically, equitable and meaningful participation for women. So I look forward to working with you all to achieve this goal, and I thank UNIDIR and UNODA for organizing these very important events, and thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It was a pleasure to join you all today. Thank you very much for my colleagues from UNODA who have been uh, help us set up the webinar and run all this so smoothly. And I wish you all a great day, uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. And I look forward to staying in touch. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.